seat, everyone. Please have a seat. Um, it's really good to be back in Michigan. I want to thank you all for the work you're doing. I want to thank Debbie Stabenow. Where are you? She, that extraordinary senator of yours. She's over there somewhere. There she is. Thank you, Senator. Every time I think I've come to the state, she's met me on the tarmac, including today. Thank you for your leadership always. Thank you. Um, before we begin our conversation today with these two extraordinary leaders, um, I do want to discuss briefly um, what happened on Saturday. I've not had a chance yet to, to publicly talk about it. Um, but I will say a few words about the attempt on the life of former President Trump over the weekend. As we all know, it was a heinous, horrible, and cowardly act. My husband Doug and I are thankful he was not seriously injured. That day, as soon as we saw what was happening, we said a prayer for his well-being. And our thoughts immediately turned to Melania, who we have met, and their family. The bottom line is no one should have to fear for the safety of a loved one because they serve in public office. Our heart goes out to the family of Corey Comparator, a true hero who died protecting his family. And Doug and I, of course, are holding them close in our hearts. We are also wishing those who were critically injured that day a swift and full recovery. And we are thankful to the United States Secret Service, the first responders and local authorities. The United States of America I believe is the greatest democracy the world has ever known. Yes. But in the aftermath of this weekend's shootings, and shooting, excuse me, one of the questions we now confront, the one of the questions we now confront is about the way we should engage with one another in this campaign. On Sunday evening, our President Joe Biden issued a call for unity. And there must be unity around the idea that while our nation's history has been scarred by political violence, violence is never acceptable. There can be no equivocation about that. At the same time, the hallmark of American democracy, the hallmark of any democracy, is a strong competition of ideas, policies, and a vision for the future. And just as we must reject political violence, we must also embrace a robust discussion about what is at stake in this election. The surest way to reaffirm the strength of our democracy is by engaging in a vigorous and civil exchange of ideas. And one of the ideas and one of the principles that is at stake in this election is the issue of reproductive freedom. And that is why I am here today to discuss that topic. And I look forward to our conversation. Thank you all very much. All right, I get to kick this off. It's an honor. I'm here as a conservative, pro-choice woman. And I don't think 10, five, or even maybe two years ago, we would have been talking about reproductive rights in elections. Because it was seen as too controversial, not a winning issue, and frankly, it seemed like settled law. Clearly, the landscape has shifted 180 degrees. How do you see this moment and how we got here? So first, I want to thank the two of you for your extraordinary courage and leadership on this issue. The voice that you each have carried and continue to carry is the voice of so many people who may not have the um, ability to do what the two of you have done so courageously, and I thank you for that. Uh, and we should applaud their courage. It takes a lot of courage to do what you two are doing. Extraordinary courage. So just over two years ago, the highest court in our land, and you know, I think about it, the court of 
Thurgood Marshall and RBG <laughs> took a constitutional right that had been recognized from the people of America, from the women of America. And thereafter, in state after state, extremists proposed and passed laws that would punish health care providers. I mean, in a state like Texas, you know they, their, their law provides for life in prison for a doctor who administers care. Laws that would punish women, criminalize doctors, punish women. Laws that make no exception even for rape and incest. You know, many of you know I started my career as a prosecutor. You may not know one of the reasons why. When I was in high school, I learned that my best friend was being molested by her stepfather. And I said to her, you have to come stay with us. You have to come live with us. I called my mother. My mother said, of course she does. And she did. So I decided I wanted to take on a career that was about protecting, in particular, women and children from violence. And the notion that these extremists would say to a survivor of such a crime of violence and a violation of someone's body, and to say to that survivor, and you have no right or authority to decide what happens to your body next, that's immoral. What has been happening in our state is that, you know, I've talked with so many women who have a similar story to what you have shared, women who want to have children and have gone through the horrible experience of a miscarriage and need care, need medical care, and denied, denied access to an emergency room because the, the health care providers there believed they would be exposed to a criminal case if they helped. The number of stories that I've heard about women silent, and their, their partners, their spouses, their families silently suffering. Think about what's happening in our country when you know that the majority of women who receive abortion care are mothers. Okay? Well, God help her if she's in a state with a ban. God help her if she has paid family leave or affordable child care. Think about, you know, I say to my, my staff and my team for years, I say, you know, in public policy, always ask, how does this impact a real human being? Right? <laughs> so think about, think about what we're saying to her, that she's going to, God help her if she's got extra money to buy a plane ticket and for a hotel room. And then what does that mean? She has to go to the airport, stand in line at TSA, get on a plane, sit next to a perfect stranger, go to a city where she's never been to receive this care, to only get back as soon as she can because she got to take care of those kids. Her best friend's not with her because her best friend's taking care of the kids. Think about what we're putting people through. The other thing, though, that I have experienced in these two years as I travel around our country, and I've... I've taken almost a hundred trips in connection with this issue. It's, it's my sixth time since the Dobbs decision coming to Michigan. And one of the things I've found also are the stories of people who tell me about themselves. You know, I, I, I once felt very strongly about this. Didn't believe in abortion, didn't believe in it. That was but I, Right? And, and, and they are saying but I didn't expect this would happen. That was, that was a household I grew up in. That was me right. and my mom. We're conservatives. We grew up in a conservative Catholic household in Texas, a very Republican family. Mm -hmm. That was me, but we've evolved. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I think that, first of all, on this issue, most people believe that one does not have to abandon their faith or deeply held beliefs to agree the government should not be telling her what to do with her body. Right? If she chooses, she will talk with her priest or her pastor or her rabbi or her imam. But it shouldn't be the government telling her what to do. And I do believe the majority of us as Americans have empathy and don't will upon another suffering. 
I, I do believe that, and, and, I, and that's what I'm finding, to your point, about people who felt strongly before the decision came down, and now they're seeing how it's playing out, and, and they don't intend that people would have that experience. So. All right, as I mentioned earlier, I have personally navigated the challenges of miscarriage and secondary infertility, which has deepened my understanding of the importance of having the right to make informed decisions about your own reproductive health. Miscarriage is extremely common with one in four pregnancies ending in loss, yet it remains a topic that's rarely discussed openly. Yeah. My experience highlights the critical need for women to have access to safe and safe medical care. Like this conversation today, you've been intentional about speaking to folks across the political spectrum about what is at stake on this issue. You have traveled all across the country, including to tradi traditionally conservative areas to yeah. speak about the importance of reproductive freedom and have shown up at the places where freedom is under attack. Mm -hmm. And now this is your seventh visit to Michigan as vice president and the second trip this year to, to Michigan to talk about reproductive rights. Why is it important for you to show up and bring this message? Again, I thank you and both of you for being here. Um, I think we, I, I'll repeat the point that I made earlier. I think that most of us agree that we shouldn't allow supposed leaders to do things that hurt people. You know, there's something very basic about this. I think that there is something that is very basic about this in terms of who we are as Americans and our founding principles, which include a founding principle that we believe in freedom. We believe in freedom. Freedom from the government telling us what to do about matters of heart and home. We believe in the right of, of people to make basic decisions like when and if they will start a family and how. I, you know, in, in traveling the country, part of what I, I point out, which is what we all know, regardless of your gender, think about this. If we, in this year of our Lord, 2024, have a state of being where the government can tell you what to do with your body, I mean, the most basic of things you should have control over, Everybody better watch out about what other freedoms you're taking for granted. Yeah. And you are right that this is something that, in my experience traveling the country, um, going to so-called red and so-called blue and so-called purple states, is that, you know, you look at when this issue was on the ballot, from, you know, Montana to... to, to, to I don't know, Virginia, I mean, look at so-called red and blue states. Whenever it was on the ballot, the American people voted for freedom. The American people voted for freedom. So I think it's, it's, basic, it's, it's something that should also in this moment in our country where for the last few years we've seen such division and attempts to divide us, um, this is a very, very serious, pivotal, foundational issue. But what we have seen is when the American people are presented with this issue, regardless of what party they're registered to vote with, they stand for freedom. Yeah. In that vein, um, and thank you, by the way, for traveling, for all the travel that you've done to reach the more conservative areas, I think this is an incredibly important conversation and moment to have. Uh, the extremists. The extremists are not not done. For me, and I think Amanda would probably say the same. This isn't this isn't the Republican I grew up with. This isn't the party that I supported. About the things that I'm seeing uh, that Donald Trump has implemented along the way, and I have greater concerns about what's to come. Yeah. Um, what do you think is next? We have 111 days to determine that. <laughs> <laughs> I, 
<laughs> because therein also, in the, in the midst of those who are trying to take individual freedoms, including the power to make basic decisions about your own life, um, we should remember the power of the people to make a decision about who sits in these offices. And that power rests with us, each one of us. And in these moments, we should not become dispirited. This is not a time to throw up our hands. This is a time to roll up our sleeves. But you're right. I mean, so the former president, first of all, it, listen, he hand-selected three members of the United States Supreme Court with the intention that they would do exactly what they did. And he's told us over and over again who he is on this subject. And then now, well, you know, there's a bit of a gaslight going, gaslighting going on where, oh, well, no, I just believe it should go to the states. Okay, so first of all, any of the historians here will know what that means when we start pushing states' rights. But let's put that aside. Um, Okay, so you believe it should go to the states. Well, the way I look at it is, then let's look at all the, I think it's now 21 or 22, Trump abortion bans in those 21, 22 states, which again, make no exception, some for rape or incest, which have contributed to, to, to IVF clinics and care being stifled, which have contributed to women having I mean, awful experiences around miscarriage, which have contributed to people who are doctors and nurses and healthcare providers being afraid they might go to jail for administering care. And, you know, and then recently the former president selected his running mate, um, the Senator Vance, J.D. Vance, um, understand. This is a fellow who in the United States Senate participated in blocking protections for IVF. This is an individual who has said he is for a national and has made every indication that he is for a national abortion ban. And so again, this is where the power is with the people. We have an election coming up. Don, listen, in, in, in contrast to the former president, Joe Biden has been very clear, has been very clear. If there were any attempt at a national abortion ban, he would veto it. And if we have the right people in Congress, people like Debbie Stabenow and others, and they put back in law the protections of Roe v. Wade, our President Joe Biden will sign it into law. So pivoting a little bit, um, this is an issue that I personally very much care about. I've worked on a lot, uh, especially having a family member that experienced gun violence. As you mentioned in your opening remarks, gun violence in America is top of mind for so many people right now. And there is no place for political violence or gun violence in our nation. Last year, I was proud to advocate for new laws that were passed here in Michigan. I advocated as a gun owner, a responsible gun owner, including a red flag law, universal background checks, expanding them, and a safe storage law. But we know that we still need additional reasonable gun safety laws at the federal level. Yeah. How are you and President Biden working to address gun violence in America? So, Olivia, you've been a great leader on this, and, and I'm sorry for the personal tragedies that you've experienced. Um, gun violence, in America today is the number one cause of the death of children in America. Think about that. The number one cause of the death of children in America is gun violence. Not car accidents, not some form of cancer, gun violence. Today in our country, one in five Americans has a relative, a family member who was killed by gun violence. And it doesn't have to be this way. And it's a false choice for people to say, well, you're either in favor of the Second Amendment or you want to take everyone's guns away. I'm in favor of the Second Amendment. I'm also in favor of the assault weapons ban, of universal background checks, red flag laws, right? And to your point, 
the leadership here in Michigan has been extraordinary on this. And we need people in Washington, D.C. to watch what you all have done and how you've done it because you've also pulled together coalitions of people, Democrats and Republicans and independents. That bull doesn't care who you're registered to vote with. Think about this. And then think about it in terms of the trauma. So last fall, I started a college tour. I, by the way, I love Gen Z. I, I, you know, I, if you have Gen Z in your life, maybe it's complicated for you, but they're really great. <laughs> they're really great. And um, among the many things that I would ask you know, these auditoriums full of these young leaders, I would ask them, raise your hand if at any time between kindergarten and 12th grade you had to endure an active shooter drill. It was bone chilling. Almost every hand went up. Think about that. You know, when, when I was growing up, I, I'll speak for some of us here, I think, we had fire drills. <laughs> but this is a whole other thing. And our young people think there should be in the classroom experiencing the wonders of the world and some part of their brain is concerned that someone will bust through that classroom door. And think about the trauma that gun violence has exacted not only on our young people who are afraid of what might happen in the context of a mass shooting, think of the trauma in terms of everyday gun violence that happens in places around our country, that trauma being undiagnosed and untreated, there are so many permeations and ramifications of this gun violence. In fact, we just announced a couple days ago, under the president and our administration, we created 988. In fact, I'd, I'd encourage everyone here to know about it and pass it on. And it's basically a, a crisis line where people who are in crisis, it's not, it's not only a talk line, but there are mental health professionals who answer it 24 hours a day, seven days a week, anonymously. So people can text or call when they're experiencing crisis to bring it down and also to know where to get help. But these are all the ramifications of this. And the solutions don't really require that much creativity. What they do require is people in the United States Congress have courage to act and do what we know is the right thing to do and not cower based on special interests and, and powerful lobbyists who are encouraging them to do something that actually is contrary to what is the health and well-being of our nation on such a specific issue. I've been sharing my personal story with the hope of encouraging women across the country to vote for candidates who support the right to choose because I firmly believe that politicians have no place in family planning, especially when it doesn't go as planned. Here in Michigan, we worked hard two years ago to pass Prop 3 to protect reproductive freedoms, ref reflecting the belief of 57% of Michiganders that every person has the fundamental right to reproductive freedom. However, with the upcoming presidential election, there's still so much at stake if Republicans gain control and are allowed to implement a nationwide abortion ban. Mm -hmm. With the election just four months away and the potential implications for reproductive rights, how are you planning to engage and mobilize voters and what strategies do you think will be most effective in reaching and inspiring people to take action? Thank you, Amanda, for that. One piece of this is to really remind people that they're not alone. I think there's something that has happened, I mentioned it earlier, that is making people feel like, you know, are people there for me? And we have to remind people we're all in this together. I think this is a moment that we have to be very intentional about building community, about reaching out to the folks we know relatives, neighbors, co-workers, and reminding them that we're all in this together and that we can make sense of it if we try. And part of making sense of it is reminding everyone in an election year their power to determine very important issues through their vote. And so that means, you know, reminding people 
to register to vote, reminding people to go online. There's IWillVote.org and, and to make sure you know where you're registered because sadly in so many states in our country right now they're intentionally passing laws to make it more difficult for people to vote. They're passing laws that allow, you know, for political reasons that they'll reduce the number of polling sites so that people won't know where to go vote or because there are reduced polling sites the lines will be longer which will deter people from standing in line especially if they're working two and three jobs they don't have the time so let's remind people about the connection between their lives and their vote between their power and the outcome of this election let's organize people building coalitions you know again we're there are forces trying to divide us we got to remember in our hearts and, and, and help people remember the vast majority of us have so much more in common than what separates us. We got to remember that, right? I think that's critically important. You know, sometimes these kinds of moments have a tendency, if not an intention, to make people feel small and make them feel alone and disempower people. Um, I was saying to, to, we had a brief conversation earlier, you know, I think it's, there's this perversity that has taken place over the last several years to suggest the measure of the strength of a leader is based on who you beat down, when in fact the true measure of the strength of a leader, I think we all agree, is based on who you lift up, right? <laughs> that, that the the character, the character and the strength, therefore, of a real leader, this, I'm looking at a room full of leaders, you wouldn't be here if you weren't, um, the character is, is such that that individual has some level of concern and care about the well-being of other people and then does something about it to lift them up. So let's remind people of all of that and, and let's organize and let's energize and let's mobilize. Let's, I mean, literally call up and text and email folks you know and just bug them. Just bug them. It's okay. It's election time. They'll expect it coming from you. <laughs> They'll still invite you over for Thanksgiving and Christmas. It's okay. <laughs> But let's just stay on people and, um, and in that way let them know that, that they matter and that we're all in it together. So, Well, speaking of elevating people, as we come to the close of the program, though, I, I think what you're doing is incredible. I think this is exactly the way forward. I think extending the grace that you have to have Amanda and I on stage as two Republicans or recovering Republicans, as I said earlier, I think this is an example of how we come together and how we built this coalition. Like you said, I think it's about empowering each other. And I also think it's a sign of that women are going to support women. That's right. That's We're going to exactly stand by right. other women. Right. So I hope that that's the message that carries forward. Um, and thank you for providing that avenue. Uh, for us to come together. I, I do think that this is a big moment in time for our political system and what's at stake. And so I think that the, I hope that this serves as an example for others to have these types of conversations with each other yeah. and to extend that grace and understand that right. we're going to stand by each other. They That's don't get right. to win when That's we're together. Right. That's exactly right. Thank you. And with that, thank you all. <laughs>